<laughs> this will be our 13th installment in this, on the subject of assurance. Tonight, assurance and realities to come. <clears throat> Actually, assurance is a very uh, wonderful word and a wonderful concept to think about it. It speaks of persuasion and certainty and being assured and having confidence and sureness or stability, conviction and certitude. Now, of course, you must recognize that this kind of posture is not at all common in, in Christendom. It ought to be, but it's not. And a significant percentage of professing Christians have very little, if any, assurance at all when it comes to the matter of salvation. And I see as assurance of of realities to come, the things we're going to talk about are very real. And when Jesus comes, you'll, you'll see that they were very real. Yes, there, there's no ambiguity about them at all. They're not types and shadows. They're not figments of the imagination. They're not what we hope is maybe true. These are realities, very real things. See, salvation deals with very real circumstances. It's not philosophical, not salvation. Now, there's a, there's a form of religion and an approach to it that denies the possibility of having assurance. They'll say things like, well, you can't know for sure that you're going to heaven until the day of judgment comes. Then we're all going to find out. Well, I'm suggesting to you, you do well to find out now. Amen. Amen. Assurance is integral to salvation. It's, you might say it's part of the package. That when a person is, quote, saved, when they receive Christ, or when they're added to Christ or added to the church, or when they're reconciled to God, or when they're justified by faith, or any of the other approaches to salvation, assurance comes along with it. it take, for most people, it takes a little while to take a hold of it, but uh, this is lengthened a great deal because there's not a lot of talk about it. I'm talking about preaching talk. See, salvation has a full, assurance has a full measure, the full assurance of faith, the full assurance of hope, the full assurance of understanding. See, it has a full measure, and in, in Christ, that's the thing that people live by faith. They're seeking a full measure. They're not satisfied with a fraction of what you can have in Christ. It's the most unfortunate, and it, uh, there will be harsh judgment because of this, that there's an approach to salvation or an approach to some would prefer to religion. Religion's the outward manifestation of what you believe. There's an approach to it that teaches people that if you just have some, that's enough. And actually, it's amazing how many how many people think like this? Well, at least I've got something. It's like saying, well, I got this corner in Canaan and I can't really move about, about very much in it and all of the Hittites and Jebusites and Hivites and all that are causing me a lot of trouble, but at least I got this little corner. 
Well, <laughs> that's not the way to think at all. So let's look at some of the realities that are not of this world, and we're be, we want to be assured of them. Not just say you're assured of them. Our text spoke of some of them. He had compassion of me and my bonds. That is, you did something about me being in prison. It wasn't he had just sit at home. So I feel so sorry for Paul because he's in jail. That's not uh, having compassion. <laughs> It'd be like the Samaritan walking by the person fell among thieves. He had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You actually went in the hole. You, you lost a lot of personal advantage by taking your goods and giving them to me. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in, your, knowing in yourselves that ye have a better and enduring, in heaven ye have a better and an enduring substance. Yeah. I know I didn't have that much in the bank. Well, now we're going to have to cold, hold off on that extra wide TV. I understand that now. And, but you know, I got something in heaven that outweighs this whole thing. Amen. Oh, yeah. I believe it was Sister Melissa talked about bearing your cross. You can you can smile while you're bearing it. Amen. If you know you have in heaven a better and enduring Amen. substance. You have a better substance. It's better quali qualitatively. It's better. <laughs> Quantitatively, it's better. And it's not eroding. <laughs> and the next verse says, Cast not away therefore your confidence. There's that assurance. See? There's that assurance. Don't cast away your confidence. <laughs> Perhaps tonight, the things of heaven are bright, shining brightly. We've been singing the songs of Zion. We've been hearing the words of God, and you're, you're kind of living, you're basking in the light of it. Don't cast it away. Don't let tomorrow morning let these things fade. Cast not away your confidence. Because you do, you have, not you can have, you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. <laughs> not, not, a, not you have a better and enduring idea. You have a better and enduring substance in heaven. Well, my question to you is, are you assured of this? You examine yourself to see, how, how sure am I about this? That I have a better and an enduring substance in heaven. There are things in heaven, things. Yeah. Things are realities, not ideas, not imaginations. Things are realities. They're not things of the earth that, that diminish. The older they get, they, they deteriorate. They're not that kind of things. Ephesians 1.10 talks about it that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, things, which are in heaven, in this, in this particular reference, this is, this is people, and which are on earth as people, even in him. You have a vast company of relatives in heaven. Amen. 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 You think about them when you're tempted. Think about that vast company of relatives you got in the, in the heaven that passed through tougher stuff than you ever have passed through and did it successfully. Think about that. See, it'll, it'll stabilize you. Or, or, do, or do you feel as though you're actually related to anyone in heaven? There's songs about your mother being in heaven. Well, what about there's a whole host of other 
Colossians 1 16 talks about these things in heaven for by him were all things created which are in heaven and they are upon earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones <laughs> in heaven thrones or dominions or principalities or powers see there's these kind of things in heaven these aren't inimical powers because they're not in heaven. Not inimical or hostile forces. That's, that's not what's in heaven. Unless you're not saved, then you got some hostile forces in heaven. And as I mentioned, you got a family. It's a family in heaven. See, when people emphasize this present world and present experiences of life, and the whole religion focuses on your life in the world, you forget about the family. Ephesians 3.15, of whom the whole, the whole family in heaven and in earth. Amen. And the greater part of this family is in heaven. Yeah. Are you assured they are in heaven? So just What level of confidence do you have that you're part of that family? That the greatest part is in heaven. Paul reminded earthly masters ye masters do the same thing to them for bearing threatening knowing that your master also is in heaven <laughs> that good your master so you've got this cantankerous boss needling you all the time you know you might humbly say you know, I was thinking about your master that's in heaven. He's my master too. So as all I say, I know about our master who's in heaven. You've got to be assured of this, see? So that when you face these supervisors and people, managers that are over you, you've got to be assured, yeah, but this isn't the end of the master. We got, they got a master too in heaven <laughs> Colossians 1 15 these are things in heaven now for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven now here the hope is used for the sub what the hope is in it's the object of the hope that is mentioned here your hope or the object of your hope is in heaven where have you heard before the true word of the truth of the gospel so the thing we're holding on to is not a creed. Yeah, the thing we're holding on to is not a position or a theology or an idea. It's substantive. Mm -hmm. Our hope is in heaven. Amen. We're holding on to it. Your inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 4 says, your inheritance is in heaven. So what you're going to get is in heaven. That means it's not houses and lands and dollars and cents and gold and silver. Because there isn't any of that in heaven. You say, well, wait a minute. Is it there? Aren't the streets of gold? No, the Bible doesn't say streets of gold. There's only one street in heaven. It's of gold means it's of it. You, you, he couldn't explain to you what it's made of because there isn't anything on earth like it. So he, he parallels it to yeah, that's right. the most common thing we got there is a street. And it's made out of the most precious thing you got on earth. Uh -huh. yeah. That's the best parallel I can tell you. There's nothing, you've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. This is where we're going to traffic. This is where we're going to move to and from. We're going to move on this. It's in heaven. Inheritance in heaven. And there's, we got three personalities that bear witness in heaven. They're in heaven now, but they're witnesses. John talked about them, 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. There are three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And these three are one. 
I mean, at any court of law, three witnesses would would move the case over to the whatever the witnesses said. Three witnesses is more than enough. Uh, the law just required two or more. If you had to have two witnesses in case of capital punishment, yet in case of capital punishment of the taking of life, you had to have two witnesses. But in the case of eternal life, you got three. Amen. Yeah. Three witnesses. <laughs> the Father, that's the Word that was made flesh. It's the same Word that's made flesh. And the Holy Ghost. Yes. And they're perfectly agreed. <laughs> Amen. Uh, which means if you listen to them long enough, you'll be assured. Amen. Amen. See, this is the basis of your assurance. This time, listen to the three witnesses in heaven. Father says, ye shall be my sons and daughters. Son says, he that comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Holy Spirit says, I'm interceding for you. Because you don't know what to pray for as you are. These three witnesses, they convince us. We got the real thing. <laughs> and there are things that are above Seek the things that are above. The things, either the th these realities. Seek the realities that are above. You say, well, what are they? Well, that's your business to find out. These are things that come down. <laughs> Wisdom that's from above comes down. See, there are things that come down. There are things that come from heaven. They come from heaven, but they're very real things. Faith comes from heaven. Persuasion comes from heaven. Revelation comes from heaven. And it all has to do with reality. None of it has to do with the just jostling about ideas. It, these are things in heaven. You seek the things that are in heaven. Don't wear yourself out seeking the things that are here. You can wear yourself out seeking for these things. Because no matter how many of these things you got, the world has said, we got some new things. We got some advanced things now. You can fill your garage up with these things. Seek the things that are above. Very real things. And there's a, there's a set of books that's in heaven. John the Revelator said, I, I saw the dead. Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead. With the eagle eye of faith, he looked way out there in the future. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, not book, the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were written out of the things written in the books. Think of that. Now, if you're easily tempted and you're easily drawn away, if you'll think about these books, it'll, yeah. it'll help you. If, you. if you're sneaking off to do something, you know, you, don't, you hope, I sure hope I don't see so-and-so in the mall while I'm over here. While you're standing up there at the cash register, you go, well, I, hope I, <laughs> I hope I don't come across one of the brethren up here. If you want to avoid that, think about the books. Amen. So maybe nobody saw you do it, but it was written down in the books. Yes. <laughs> or perhaps you did something good and noble and honest and nobody saw it. It is written down in the Amen. books. Amen. In the books. See, these are very real. Yes. See, we didn't really mean books. Well, they're just, yes, he meant books. He really didn't mean books. It's a different kind of book. Yeah, that's right. It's a book that's what it's inscribed with indelible ink. <laughs> when I was a, an accountant, affectionately called bean counters in those days, you always made your temporary entries in the ledger in pencil. Then after you confirmed, we had ink wells too on the desk. This was not a ballpoint pen. You could ballpoint pens were out. You couldn't use a ballpoint pen. You had to use a fountain pen because the ink was permanent. But when, when, they, when you confirmed the reality of the record, you put it in ink. 
you wrote over that pencil in ink, black, no, no blue black. You couldn't have blue black ink. You had black ink, liquid ink. You couldn't get rid of. Permanent. See, these books, they have that kind of writing in them. And you say, well, what about sins that are forgiven? Well, they're not, they're, they're, God has a, has a way of removing them from the books or at least drawing a line to them with a little note Debt paid. <laughs> I kind of think the latter is really what it, what he does. So this this debt paid in full, yeah. through there. Well, see how assured are you of these books, mm -hmm. that have the records of what everyone has done? What how, how convinced are you that these are really really books? And that book of life, oh, that, that's mentioned a lot. <laughs> We spend a lot of time, it's not all in vain, trying to figure out who's in, who's out. Because it does look kind of confusing, you know, as you, well, is that person real or are they not? And maybe they put in their are because they're, they're doing some things that look pretty good. But see, there's a book. There's a book of life. Jesus said, now he that overcomes, the same should be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book, yeah. the book, the book of life. I'll not blot his name out of the book of life, so God can blot names out of the book of life, which means they were alive for a while, or as Jesus said, they believed for a while, then they were blotted out of the book. But, but if a person... Jesus says, overcomes, I'll, I'll, not blot, I'll not blot their name. If they end up standing up, I'll not blot. Amen. I'll not blot. If they end up believing, I'll not blot them out. Just a, re, a real book. Revelation 13, 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that's the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life. So here's what happens. A person's name not in the book of life, they, they become spiritually gullible. Because their name's not in the book. They're not alive to God, so they just fall for whatever. Whatever comes along, they, they fall for it. They just swallow it down, even though it's poison. Revelation 17, 8. The beast which thou sawest was and is not, that is, he hasn't appeared. He hasn't appeared as he going to. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, like he's going to take over and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not yet is and he came back to life. See those whose names aren't in the book they are all confused by it looks like false religion was overthrown <laughs> but then it resurfaced. The people living in the days of the Reformation, they thought, that's it, we, we finally dealt the death blow to this false religion, form without power. Then it, today, it's resurfaced. Yeah, right. But if your name's in the book of life, you know perdition. Mm -hmm. This thing is destined for perdition. Yeah. Revelation 20:15. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, you want to make sure you're in the, in the book. Amen. You want to make sure your names are written in heaven. As the scriptures say. Do, are you? Are you assured of that? That your name is written in heaven? If you can't, you can be. If it is there. I mean, you can't be sure of it if it's not there. But if it's really there, you can be assured of it. Yeah. Revelation 21, 27, There shall no wise enter into it, any, that's the holy city, enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it's a real book. I tell you, it's going to make the determination. Yeah. Books to be opened, the Father's going to say, Who is, let's go over the names that are in the book. Yeah book of life. Let's go over the names. 
And if you've been persuaded of that your name's in the book of life, shall I say legitimately persuaded that your name's in the book of life, it's amazing what power you've got. You've got power to resist the devil. You've got power to forge forward. You've got power to speak without fear. See, because you know my name's in the book. Yeah. Revelation twenty two nineteen says, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part out of the book of life. And the holy city. And from the things that are written in this book. As his citizenship will be revoked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Under what conditions will his citizenship be revoked? If they tamper with this book of the revelation. Yeah. That's right. Oh, I tell that. Yeah. That's an eye opener, isn't it? Because yes. there's hardly any book of the Bible has been tampered with more than the book of Revelation. That's right. yeah. uh -huh. Now, God, let's go over this again. He said... If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. So all the good things written in this book, and there's a lot of them, he'll have no, he'll have no part in any of it. See, the way he talks, it demands that the book, that the book be real. One time Daniel, an angel appeared to Daniel and he spoke about a book that actually is in heaven and he brought word of this book down to Daniel. Daniel 10, 21. I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Now you're not talking about the Bible. That's not what he's talking about. The angel, I'm going to show you what's written in the Bible. That, that's not what the angel's saying. Scripture means writing. The NIV reads, I'll show you what's written in the book of truth. This book of truth, as I understand, is the same book that was being held when John beheld heaven and there was a book sealed and no man could open it. That, that's a, it's a book of eternal purpose. Yeah. The book of what God's doing. It says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Show you what's on page 2099 in the book of truth. This book, Daniel, is what determines what happens here. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what's noted there. <laughs> See, not everybody was privy to this. Not everybody was privy to this. What was noted in the scripture of truth. Amen. These are very real things, as I've said. Very real, very real things. And what about this? Here's something that's coming. The coming of the Lord and the destruction of the world and the day of judgment. These are, these are on the way. Hebrews 10.37, spoken many years ago. Yet a little while. You know, almost about 2,000 years have passed since that was written. Yet a little while. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. Yet just a little while, just a little that's language to faith, see. Faith doesn't think in terms of time. Amen. Think, faith thinks in terms of what will be. Amen. Or what has been done. It doesn't think in terms of time. It doesn't think 2,000 years ago. It doesn't think that way. People think that way. They're, they're historians, you know, and grammarians and experts in language and academic and... But that's not the way God talks. Amen. Little while. So uh, you lay alongside our tenure on earth with what we're going to have in the glory in little while. Yeah, right. Amen. It's a little while. I yeah. <laughs> see I've lived about 77 years. I can remember I, when I thought my dad was ancient of days at 70. But see, I have a little more understanding on the little while thing. This little while thing has uh -huh. kind of come home to me, see. But if the things that are real are told uh, are not real, then this, the little while, doesn't apply. People think things are dragging on, dragging on, dragging on because they're not assured of the, 
unseen realities. Once these dawn upon you, then it's just, you just, and it, God gives it, God enables us to live for a long period of time by breaking it up in little chunks of time. Yeah. So you don't have to live any more than a day at a time, or if you want to get technically, a minute at a time. So you live it out in these short, just to teach you, it is a little time, because you can't measure something that's really, really big. <laughs> Measurement applies to something that is that is limited, has a succinct beginning and end. That's what can be measured. And all everything within that beginning and end is little, little time. Second Peter three ten. The day of the Lord will come. It'll it'll come. As a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that these things shall all be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening that we're running toward it, see? And hastening under the coming of the day of God, we're in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, <clears throat> We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens. It's going to, we're waiting for what is left after that is burned up. We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. We're in righteousness. But see, the eternal inheritance and the reward in heaven and being forever with the Lord don't mean anything if you're not assured that the present heavens and earth are going to pass away. If that isn't sure to you, then you can't have the other part. That's why people balk, talk about eternity, and that's why they balk at this, because they really have not been convinced that where they're at is going to be destroyed. They've not yet been convinced of that reality. Now these things that we're talking about, to be assured of, they're unlike anything in the natural realm. There's, there's nothing like these. There's types and shadows and partial likenesses are found in the world, but they're not substantive. You can't, like, get a hold of the tabernacle. <laughs> How many of you have ever tried? You'll find out you can't. Or get a hold of the sacrifice of lambs, goats, sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer. You'll find out you can't. You can't get a hold of that. You, shadows and substances and substance, substitutes and types and figures, you can't get hold of them. You can talk about them, but you can't get hold of them. They're like a shadow. They get, they're like a vapor. So you, they, they, you can't get hold of them. Why? Because they're, they're not transportable to glory. So at some point you got to start talking about these Amen. eternal matters. Yeah. Unlike anything on earth, these realities cannot be confirmed by any earthly law of diagnosis. It can't, you can't confirm the presence of these things by any human means. Such things as the... Uh, the Son of God. You can't prove this. You can't prove that the Son of God is. You can't prove it by any laws to man, of man. You can't prove the day of Pentecost occurred <laughs> where the Spirit came down and the prompt. You can't prove that. It's not like that, that kind of thing. The, only, the way you prove it is your faith proves it. Your assurance proves it. But you can't prove it any other way. Assurance can't come by means of natural experiences. Why, well, that's easy to say. But there's a lot of people in Christendom that they don't teach this at all this way. They teach, if you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you speak in an unknown tongue, that's your proof. Or you're slain in the Spirit and he knocks you down and you don't know what happened, you don't know what you said, but that's your proof. Oh, listen, there's people. Oh, yeah. I've been had a woman explain to me how it felt. She described the sensation. And 
I must admit I was a little crude in those days. But I said it was something like taking hold of a stick in your finger and a electric plug. Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's something like that. <laughs> you can't substantiate spiritual life by external means. You can't do it. Or the things that are in heaven, you can't, you can't prove them to the flesh. It can't be done. Men cannot embrace realities of which they're not persuaded. That's exactly why there's a great number of professing Christians that can't get hold of these things. It's because they don't think they're real. Hebrews 11, 13 says, These all died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. All right, so now you've got a situation where you've got professing Christians, They've gone through all of the required procedures. Their names are written on the church books. They can take communion. But they're not really persuaded of what God has promised. And so they live these sloppy lives. They dabble in this and they dabble in that. And they're not godly and they're not holy and they don't live by every word of God. And why don't they? Why don't they? We know they should, but why don't they? Because they're not, they're not persuaded of the reality of those things. Amen. No matter what they say. Yeah. So what can we do about it? Well, you, you've got to speak about the things in order for the God to convince him that these things that so-and-so is mentioning, this is very real. So when Peter came to the house of Cornelius, he commenced to speak about things that he'd seen. That he said, oh, God has showed me that uh, any person that lives for him and is righteous is accepted. Yeah, it wasn't in a book someplace. That was that was it. That was a that was in the books, <laughs> and God showed it to him, and so he passed it on to Cornelius. And lo and behold, Cornelius he believed it too. He believed it because somebody said it to him. The eunuch he's riding along in a chariot. He's reading the Bible. He'd been to church. Unlike a lot of people go to church, he's reading up reading the Bible on the way home. And he is, quite frankly, kind of confused about what he was reading. An angel was dispatched from heaven because this man was obviously a, had a good heart, honest and good heart. So he dispatched Philip down there. And Philip just, he said, well, do you understand what you're reading? He said, I, said, I don't know if this man is talking about himself or some other man. He said, I can't understand it unless someone will explain it to me. Why did he need explanation? Because it was dealing with something that wasn't of the earth. It wasn't of the world. So it couldn't be comprehended by natural tools. So Philip just said, oh, where are you reading? I'm reading over in Isaiah 50. He will start there. And he expounded to him. Jesus Christ, who's real. Yeah, amen. And the eunuch, he saw it. Mm -hmm. And he believed of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he saw that Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. See? Now, amen. I know I could have done a lot better than I did on this, but assurance has more to do with what you can't see and can't touch than what you can see and can touch. Amen. It has to do with things that are eternal in their essence and that have been determined by God yeah. and exist in heaven and will someday be revealed. Mm -hmm. okay. 
You don't want to wait till then <laughs> to be convinced of their reality, and, and there's, that's what these meetings are all about. That's why we get together mm -hmm. to help nail this thing down in our conscience that the things we're talking about are not just ideas. These are very real things, very real promises, very real inheritance, very real life, very real intercessor, very real mediator, very little, very real comforter. These things are very, very real. And when you're convinced of them, yeah. then heaven takes you by your hands and starts walking you along. <laughs> That's how it works, brother. I'm thankful for uh, things that are real. Yes, amen. I'm sure you're like me in this regard of experienced some disappointments when you you're banking on something and then you, you found out it wasn't it wasn't what the people said. But aren't you glad, huh, that what God's told you is real? Amen. And when you're convinced of it. You start singing and going on your way, rejoicing. Amen. Well, the Michael has our exhortation tonight.